Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. And as people join us, they'll get into the real meat of the training. So um, welcome everybody to um, Effective Messaging Strategies for Housing as a Solution to Homelessness. Uh, I'm Amy Denhart. I am the Director of Funders Together to End Homelessness San Diego. Um, and I'm here joined by uh, our wonderful partners in this work, Mixty Communications. And I'll introduce you to the members of Mixty in just a bit. So um, thank you all for being here today. If you just joined us, um, over 180 of you registered for this. So it's really exciting that our community wants to learn more about how to effectively message to solve this uh, issue that is so near and dear to our hearts. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Funders Together for those of you who um, may not know who we are. So Funders Together, we are a funders collaborative and we cover the entire region of San Diego. Um, we are made up of mostly private funders, private philanthropy, um, Parker Foundation, Bequest Foundation, Jewish Community Foundation are some of our members, as well as we have some public funders who are part of our uh, Funders Together board. They include the San Diego Housing Commission, the County of San Diego, and the Regional Task Force on Homelessness. So we, what we do in terms of grant making and investing in we invest in the homeless crisis response system and we do it on a system-wide level. So while all of you represent or many of you represent wonderful providers and have a philanthropy that rightly invests in the great work you're doing, we actually pool our resources to look at um, the system level response and how to make the system as a whole just work better. So that led to um, why we decided to do this almost a year doing this uh, research and messaging campaign. So let me give you a little bit of context of why we did this work. Um, and it'll probably be familiar to you. So back around the 2020 election cycle, we noticed that there was really in the, in the public discourse, in the media, on social media, um, next door, et cetera, there was really a lot of misinformation about solutions to homelessness. There were mixed messages. There was even some very mean spiritedness. And just, we decided that what we need to do is we really need to bring the public together and give the public more information about what are the real solutions to homelessness. And the real solution starts with housing. And we know, of course, we need supportive services in order to help people maintain their housing, but we really needed to start with housing as the central solution to homelessness while also addressing the support services. So we did, um, we reached out and we um, realized that we wanted to do a narrative change campaign with the public and an education for the public. So we hired Mixi Communications to help us to do this work. And so over the past year with our partners at Mixi Communications, um, Mixi has led research and a narrative campaign on social media in order to figure out what are the most effective messages that resonate with the public in order to center housing as the solution to homelessness. So all of you today, as I mentioned, um, we had 180 people register. All of you are part of the solution as well. So what we, our goal with this is funders together, a small funders collaborative is not going to be the main messenger for this campaign. We ran a social media campaign. It got a lot of reach, but really we're relying on you as our allies who are doing this important work to help us to message with the, with the public about what real solutions are and housing as a central solution. So today we're gonna walk you through the research we did, what the public is saying about this, what the public feels about this, and then what we found is effective messaging for the public. So I want, I'm joined here today by three members of the Mixi Communications team and um, uh, Drew with Strategy 360. So let me introduce our partners in this work. So with the Mixi team, we have Jamie Hampton, Kareem Bori, and Michael Sparacino, who are from Mixi Communications, who led most of this work. And we're also joined here today by Drew Lieberman with Strategies, Strategies 360. And Drew led our polling work, which was really to uh, 
really important to this campaign in terms of gauging what is the public saying. And also Drew helped us really to target our audience. To We were really targeting kind of moderate voters in the coastal county areas with our work. So um, I'm going to turn it over now to Jamie to do, oh, housekeeping, I'm sorry. Um, if you have questions, we're actually going to do questions at the end. So we're gonna open up Q&A at the end. So please remember your questions. And now I'm going to turn it over to Jamie Hampton with Mixi to do the training. Thanks, Amy. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to support you all on this work for the last year. Um, I am actually just gonna kind of uh, touch on how we got here. Um, next slide, Jeremy. Real quickly, um, Amy, you covered a lot of this, but I do want to talk about Housing First as this jargony um, social program that we all know. Um, and what was important for us about sort of looking at Housing First versus the language of housing as the place to start to solve homelessness um, is that we sort of had to break through the jargon, though we know this program is specifically mentioned um, as key parts in the strategic plans for the city and the county. So um, it's a really critical aspect for us to figure out and how to um, get the community to understand that what we mean by that is starting with a home and then the services come from that and that combo is um, a, a key message to help us um, eventually get to the end of homelessness. Um, I think Amy covered the rest of this, so we can go ahead and go on to the next slide, Jeremy. I just want to give you a big picture overview of our methodology and how we evaluated data through the last year. And then the other folks on the team will actually dive into that data. Um, so for where we started was basically very large. And then we tried to narrow as locally and as specifically as we could. So we started with this large body of research from a lot of the national institutions and big players that we all follow that are putting out regular research and data all of the time and several of the key players in regional places. We're going to dig into what we learned from that research, but essentially we could see the messages in all of those pieces and narrow them or summarize them into five key themes that we saw over and over again used um, when it comes to talking about housing and the solutions to homelessness. Those um, key themes, and I'm going to tell them to you, we'll get into the details in a little bit, but I, I just want to kind of set the stage because we talk about those themes a lot. Community, compassion, collaboration, opportunity, and then housing first. Those were the, the kind of the summary of what we saw through that research. Now, as a messaging company, we also thought, OK, well, we need to kind of apply a rubric to that so that we can evaluate which of those themes are effective. So Mixty brought to that five areas that we evaluated those big picture themes initially. We wanted to make sure that there was clear and direct language. We wanted to make sure that it was data driven, but not only relying on data, that there was a story behind it, that the message was empathetic and relatable, and that it had actionable solutions. We'll share with you a little bit later what we found out from that. Once we worked on those um, kind of that big body of research, we then um, worked through a database called Meltwater to evaluate media coverage specific to San Diego County. And then we dug a little bit deeper into social media and the online presence of a few key players, including the executive committee of the regional task force on homelessness, um, county elected officials, city elected officials, and those folks who were running for office at the time. And then for fun, we looked at the committee members of funders together to end homelessness to see what they were saying online. We then took that and partnered with Drew, who then um, did a poll of San Diego constituents. Um, in that poll, we were working on folks in the middle. So we were looking at high propensity voters um, in county districts one, three, and five, um, one, three, and four. Thank you, Drew. And then the city of San Diego. Um, and that is what we then, um, once we got the results from the poll, pulled into our five month digital marketing campaign, again, focused on the constituents in those areas and the um, in the county and the city of San Diego, really focused on um, high propensity moderate voters thinking that if we're going to change 
change the narrative and we can affect those people who we, we know we can move, that's where we were going to start. Thanks, Jamie. So um, as Jamie was saying, um, in order to de determine what type of message is most effective, it's necessary for us to move forward with an analysis and analyze and review various types of those messaging concepts. Um, and you can go to the next slide, Jeremy. But ultimately, to do this, the first step of our analysis was to look at what the public's opinion was on homelessness in San Diego and what their positions were on housing as a solution. And we ultimately did this through a number of ways. It was through reviewing public opinion polling, uh, conducting public surveys, and as mentioned before, our final phase of our campaign, which was running a five month social media ad campaign. Um, Jeremy, you can go to the next slide, but before we moved into the polling and our social media campaign, funders together ran a hypothesis to determine which messaging theme resonated the most. And Jamie highlighted what these five themes were, and I wanted to dive a little bit more into what um, we actually mean by these themes. So collaboration is when we is the idea of incorporating how education, health, racial equity, and economic mobility are connected to housing. The theme of community is the idea of housing as a means to serve our communities as a whole. Housing first, this does not, this theme doesn't necessarily mean directly the, the program of housing first, but instead the idea that one must start with a home. Um, a fourth theme of opportunity focuses on the notion that creating affordable housing opportunities means talking about equity. And then lastly, compassion, which focuses, focuses on caring for individuals and in meeting their needs. Um, and now what I wanted to do, I wanted to take a real quick poll. These were our five themes. Um, and based on these themes, I wanted to see to you, the audience, which of these five messaging themes you think, before we dive a little bit more into our findings, which one you think would resonate, resonate most with the public? So there should be a, a quick poll that's just popped up on your screen. If you could go in and, and enter what you think is the theme that resonates most. Um, let's take a moment to do that. And then Jeremy, I think you can close the poll. So it looks like from the results, um, community is what you all have chosen. It has the most with 30% and actually housing first and compassion, not that far behind. Um, and then collaboration and opportunity being the last. So we will, we're going to dive into the data a little bit more and then after we dive into the data we'll answer in a short while which theme actually performed best in our research and why um but before we dive into that data in a little bit more of that analysis i just kind of wanted to give a preview and highlight the overall theme that we found throughout um our campaign and our analysis and whether it was through our national and local research, media scans, um, polling, or the surveys, or the ads that we ran in the final stage. And, and what that is, is that it's clear from the campaign that constituents feel it, it's necessary to solve homelessness, but they are confounded. There are confounding issues that get in the way of understanding housing as the primary path to achieve that goal. Um, now, Drew is going to dive a little bit more into the data and the key findings of our polling. So I will let Drew take it away from here. All right, I think I'm off mute. I was, uh, I was still trying to vote, but it wouldn't let me. Um, uh, and, and honestly, I, I might be a good lead in here. I, was actually, I probably would have voted slightly differently uh, now I knew the results, but based going into it, I think I would have voted differently than the results showed us. Uh, but actually what you guys responded here uh, is pretty reflective of the population that we 
that we sampled, which we'll walk through this real quickly, but the answer to some degree uh, is all of these things are pretty effective and we had to figure out how to kind of put the puzzle together in a way that reinforces uh, you know, everything that everybody's been talking about before. And so I think this data you'll see actually does uh, really strongly reflect some of the comments that Amy and Jamie and Michael have made so far. Um, I don't know, is it pot? Oh, I get it too close, Never mind. now I can see the screen. Um, so this has been referenced. This is just really quickly. What we did was a survey, uh, as Jamie mentioned, in supervisor districts one, three, and four. Uh, we targeted specifically uh, people who self-identified as moderate and had a high propensity to vote. So this is not a uh, representative audience of the entire of San Diego County or the city, um, but one uh, particular target segment within that. Uh, we can go to the next slide here. Uh, so just really, this is probably not going to surprise anybody. And again. Uh, this this is just sort of that moderate audience, but we just asked people, how do you think the local government's doing when it comes to addressing homelessness in the county? Uh, and you can see here the answer is not too good. And you know this is just one question in a poll. There are lots of reasons for why uh, this is the this is the result, um, and a lot of things that may may or may not be within government control. But uh, this is the starting point, and the the point is that. This is a pervasive problem. It's not one that's getting better. And certainly we're seeing that reflected in this audience. Uh, I'm going to the next slide. This is really important. It's, uh, this was a little bit before we got into the messaging, but it gave us some real context for uh, how to interpret the messaging uh, information here. And it's something that uh, Amy and Jamie have hit on clearly, which is uh, it sort of sets the stage for the, the notion that we shouldn't view this as a zero sum game, but rather uh, a collaborative effort that, that has everything working together. And the point here is that we ask people, okay, here's a bunch of solutions uh, that we might be put into practice to address the homelessness problem. And you can see here, they're all relatively effective. Uh, people believe that all of these things will work to one degree or another, but uh, uh, addressing mental health, substance abuse, some of these supportive services uh, really stands out as something that people find very effective. We see this across polling on this issue, whether it's in San Diego, California, across the Western US. Um, and so that tells us something about how we need to talk to this audience and not uh, ignoring the types of things that they find uh, really important. Um, so we go to the next slide here. So this is, here are the five feeds. And these were presented to respondents in the poll as longer messages. Um, I've got them here. And uh, the takeaway here is you know, all of these actually scored pretty well. If you look at the numbers on the far right, you see everything here is giving, you know, at least like two thirds of the audience are saying, yeah, this is a message that I agree with. Um, there's there's some a gap in intensity here where collaboration and compassion those two messages sort of stood out as the people that say I really strongly agree with that um, some of that may not be too surprising but uh, so there's a little bit of a hierarchy here uh, but again all of these things sort of work together and actually if you go to the next slide this is this to me is sort of the most interesting these two slides together were sort of the meat of the of the poll and, and a really interesting takeaway which is if you go to that on that last, you don't have to go back, but on that last slide, we saw compassion and collaboration spiking. After we introduced all of those messages, we came back and asked people, okay, in a forced choice, uh, you know, which of these, uh, like sort of rank them against each other, which are the top two out of all of those. So they ranked them individually and then we said, let's, let's force a choice here and which really stand out to you. And you see, uh, it's it sort of this, the, uh, it reorients itself. Uh, and so, uh, you see opportunity now spike into that top tier and you see housing first uh, move into that top tier. So uh, it's interesting. It was, they were producing individually a slightly different response than when we force a choice. And that's really important information for us to have. Um, and it tells us a lot about what we need to do, which I think if we go to the next slide here. So uh, I've just got two more slides and we'll try to get through this relatively quickly here. But the, the, the core takeaways, this was a pretty short poll. We were, we were pretty focused on what we needed to accomplish here, which was to understand the messaging in these five frames in order to inform the campaign. Um, but the, you know, the key takeaways, one, uh, this is six months ago, but I can promise you nothing has changed. This is a, uh, a big problem in the county uh, and one that people are uh, frustrated with, both in terms of actually making progress, but also the way it's being handled. And that sets the stage, of course, for doing something differently. Um, to a reaction to the pervasiveness of the problem, not surprisingly, is let's be open to uh, 
let, let's be open to basically anything that might work here. And uh, we see that with homelessness. We see that with housing in general. People are kind of like at the point where it's like, let's try some things. Let's just, let's get things done. Um, and then we saw, uh, you know, collaboration and compassion sort of jumped out initially, but we, we saw this sort of uh, everything elicited a positive response and then a little bit of a reorientation of the, of the top tier in that next slide. Uh, so let's go now to the last one. So this is, of course, like, well, what do we do with this information? What does it all mean? How do we kind of distill this in a way that's usable uh, for the team to kind of start communicating with people? Um, and I think we saw, you know, we saw housing first can be really powerful. And what we want to do is uh, is make that case, you know, in within the the confines of the other things that people think are important. So we don't want to push people into their corner by saying, you know, this is zero sum. We we have to do housing first, and the rest of it is less important, right? We don't want to sort of create that tension between these things because that's not where these voters are. They're saying, no, the the supportive services are the most important, likely to be the most effective. So let's not push against that. Uh, let's make a clear case to them that uh, that sequencing is is important here. Is you can't those those supportive services will be far less effective if uh, if somebody's on the streets. And that and that was you, you actually see in those two slides. Again, we don't have to go back, but uh, when we presented the language slightly differently. Uh, in fact, I think actually this is worth me just saying. Hang on, I got it on my other screen. When we when we read the housing first message. Uh, it used the phrase, too often we put the cart before the horse by trying to address substance abuse and mental health while people are still living on the streets. And that type of language, I think, pushed people into their corner and say, wait, the cart, like you got the wrong cart and the wrong horse, and we actually look at it the other way. And so we want to stay away from that, but actually just say, look, this is all part of the approach and sequencing matters here. Uh, and then, you know, th this last point. So I, I think what, what I took away from this is this was less about you know, a major policy shift. It actually uh, it reinforced the the notion that housing first is an important policy prescription. Um, it also is a theme that can be powerful for people, uh, but we've got to present it the right way. And it's just it. Mostly, my takeaway from this was this is about nuance and making sure that uh, as we're talking about this with the public, uh, that they're hearing something that's reinforcing their pre existing beliefs while sort of adding this element of there's a there's an even better way to do this that, that will be more effective. Um, and, and you just sort of saw the way that people accepted that housing first message, that opportunity message if, if with a slight reframing. Uh, so that's where we ended up on this. And I, I think that's the last slide on the polling part. And I've probably used up more than my five minutes. Thanks, Drew. So as Drew explained, the learning from the polling is really, it's less about theme or policy and it's more about the nuances of language and presentation. However, what if we could nail down a, an actual theme? As you saw from Drew's slides, all the themes tested really well and were receptive to the public. So in an effort to continue testing messaging, um, that's what we did. The, the polling results showed which themes the public felt would resonate the best, but we wanted to see the messaging and actual action. So to do this, we ran two testing phases. Uh, and at the conclusion of those testing phases, um, we would then have our, our actual theme. So which theme do we think worked the best? So based on everyone's production, prediction earlier that we did in the, the poll uh, at the beginning of the webinar, um, it looks like everyone thought that that would be community. Um, Jeremy, if you go to the next slide, um, what we'll see is actually through our testing, it was clear that the opportunity message created the most engagement amongst all audiences. And the reason why the opportunity messaging resonated the most is because it uses a combination of clear and it kind of, to step back for a moment, it kind of uses a combination of a, a lot of the various themes. So it uses a combination of clear and direct language um, as you saw from the forced choice the thematic exercise with Drew, opportunity performed really well there. Um, it allows relevant data to be highlighted um, and the opportunity thing can also be emphatic and empathetic and relatable and it showcases actionable solutions. Um, 
lastly, the final testing also showed that sprinkling in some compassion into the messaging and content it was beneficial as well, which also points to the, the findings from Drew's polling of compassion scoring, scoring well. Um, now, in order to better understand which issues were more likely to engage key demographics in the county, in Funders Together conducted a five-month digital marketing campaign as the final test to confirm the messaging hypothesis and to see what works locally. So after the messaging theme of opportunity was determined, content for the campaign um, was used with similar pictures and videos, all using that opportunity theme to provide a constant throughout the cam campaign's entirety. And you're actually seeing the pictures and content in this um, webinar presentation that was used in the campaign and in the ads. Um, the issues tested through the ads were um, as follows. We started with our control group, which was just a general opportunity message. Um, and then we dove into issues such as programs and services, costs, and racial equity. And this was done by implementing a, a paid social media campaign throughout a five month period with each month representing a different message, focusing on these various housing issues. Um, and the same ads and messaging were used in both months, months one and five, that control group in order to determine how the audience was moved from the beginning to end of the campaign and learn if the various issues in the middle of the campaign shaped their opinion over time. So ultimately, what did we learn from this ad campaign that we ran? Um, and Jeremy, you can head to the next slide. Perfect, thank you. Um, what we learned was that the, the audience did in fact move throughout the campaign. The, the final two months of the campaign created a ton more engagement compared to the first three months. We saw regional and, and demographic differences as well. Throughout the course of the campaign, the audience and city districts were twice as likely to watch um, contact fe content featuring videos compared to other areas of the county. Um, on Facebook, baby boomers engaged twice as much more as Gen Xers. Um, a couple of main themes emerged in some of the sentiments ex expressed. There was moderate criticism for uh, city council members and the mayor. Um, there was dis disorganization of local government and the inability to get on the same page with policies to meet the needs of San Diego. San Diegans also emerged as a major, main theme. Um, and then also our campaigns showed that specific content should be targeted. And what we mean by this is so um, in the, the ads run, it was obvious that Gen X viewers were more likely to respond to content, including polling, um, while millennials were more likely to respond to content without. Um, and then the other thing that we saw was um, Twitter was a really great platform cre for creating engagement compared to Instagram, even, even with younger audiences. And I think this can be attributed to the fact that some millennials may view Twitter more as a platform for sharing ideas and catching up with the news and trends of the world versus Instagram being a, more, a platform more for casual and visual content. Um, and now I'm gonna pass it to Kareem, who's gonna dive a little bit more into our actual findings. Great, <clears throat> thank you, Michael. Um, so we just spent a lot of time talking about the methods, the data, the ads, and now we're gonna transition into the meat of what today is really about, which is what does it mean? Because we're gonna we're gonna take the next few minutes to unpack the reasons why it's so important for all of us to sing from the same songbook. Because after all, we've committed both at the city level and the county level to housing as the solution because we know it works. So we have to figure out ways to bring the rest of San Diego residents to understand why. So Jeremy, thank you. Um, so as so how do we get there? Well, first, the first thing we realize is that we have to start debunking myths and prejudices. 
you saw it from some of the data. And for those of you who are the advocates, who are the service providers, you probably bang your heads against your walls regularly when it comes to the reasons that people imagine um, our homeless residents get on the streets in the first place. So, for example, it, we the overwhelming majority of constituents believe programs are essential. So that's a wonderful thing. But the, the, the big, the first challenge we have is which programs they seem to think are most essential. For example, the number one program, and you saw that in the poll results, that the public believes are necessary are services to provide mental health and substance abuse support. Well, those of you who are in the field know that those with mental health and, and substance abuse needs account for less than 40% of those without a home. So we have this big disconnect between the image of who is homeless and the kinds of needs that are more important for them. So this is, so when you combine that with the fact that more people than not believe that homelessness is getting worse in their area, and they're leaning on their public officials to do more, again, a second piece of data that you just heard Drew introduce to us, three quarters of our folks are pretty unhappy with the role that government is playing here. Then that means that when we think about the messengers who can really drive this debunking of the right solutions. We're talking about elected officials here, for example. They can use this data to address these common beliefs and educate the public on the real solutions. So if we move to the next slide, Jeremy. We, we just spent a little bit of time really maybe giving our elected officials a hard time. But let's look at another opportunity here to improve our collective messaging. And those other kinds of public facing platforms and individuals who have access to those platforms. So as Jamie mentioned, there's a large variance in the way the nonprofit leaders talk about the issue, even though they're all sitting around the same table. We looked you up. So anybody who's on the RTFH executive committee, we looked you up. We looked at how you were talking about the issue on your websites, on your blogs, on, in media, if you were interviewed. We, we looked at your social and figured out who's, who, what words and what themes do you rely on most. And as Jamie and Amy both confirmed, there's no consistency in the frame and then the theme that's being used here. So another opportunity is media. So from an engagement and education perspective, educating those that cover the topic the most is a critical opportunity for us. So for example, among the top 25 San Diego publications, as Jamie mentioned, we used a service that, pulled, that dug and got actual metrics on the topic of homelessness and um, looked at who was covering it more. And we looked at both the outlets and the reporters. So out of the top 25 San Diego publications, there were three that accounted for 50% of the volume of mentions of homelessness. And those were the UT, KPBS, and Voice of San Diego. So, you know, if you track media in San Diego, that's really not a surprise, they're pretty large. Um, but if you start digging into maybe who are those, the individuals within the media sector, that are mostly influencing and covering the story, there were three people that accounted for more than one third of that volume. And those were Andrew Bowen at KPBS and uh, two reporters from um, the Times of San Diego, Debbie Sklar and Ken Stone. So for those of us who work in media relations and public relations, that came a little bit as a surprise because when we focus our efforts, we tend to go to the larger publications. But when you look at the amount of coverage that Times of San Diego is giving this issue, this is such a missed opportunity to some degree that we have a, that we can now capitalize on. Mike, it's back at you. Thanks, Kareem. So uh, another opportunity that we have here is to use social media to get out our messaging. And social media is a great tool for building awareness. Um, it provides a platform for city council members, um, county board of supervisors, RTFHH representatives, and so many more to spread their word. Um, it allows a greater amount of people to be reached and the data availability makes it possible to gauge when sentiment is being moved. 
Um, hence, there's even more reason why it's important for all to be sharing a consistent message. Um, what we found through our research is images of real people experiencing homelessness in, in San Diego um, are important to be, it's important to our were um, vital and outperformed using basic like stock photography. And I guess the message that driving home there is that um, it's important to showcase real moments in, in, in their quality um, and environment. Um, though another thing that was consistent throughout the campaign was that video always performed better versus still imagery. And, and video is more likely, video is more likely to draw an audience. Um, with videos, sometimes um, we can get intimidated by what that means. And it doesn't need to be an overall award-winning production, but just sometimes a, a quick video to share an update can be productive. Um, and then lastly, all audiences were more likely to engage on Facebook and Twitter compared to Instagram. And even when it comes to younger audiences and the best conclusion that can be made from that is that based on the subject matter, these are the platforms that the audience would prefer, prefer to engage in. Um, now I'm gonna pass it to Jamie, who's going to speak a little bit more about exactly how we want to frame our messaging. Thanks, Michael. Um, one of my favorite takeaways from our digital marketing campaign, we divvied up the ads to baby boomers, millennials, and Gen X to see how they would respond differently. And almost without exception, the millennials only responded in GIFs and emojis. It's just amazing. Um, okay, so that is the big body of research. Um, what does that mean for what each of us can do today when we walk away from this training? That is what we're going to spend the next several minutes talking about. My job here is to make it as easy as possible for you to take what we learned, go back to your office, or maybe just join your next Zoom meeting and start messaging um, right away so that we can start building a new narrative around housing as the solution to homelessness in San Diego. So we're going to introduce you to a messaging triangle. Um, this uh, next slide, Jeremy, is nothing new to, to many of you, I hope, and it's not proprietary to Mixty. This messaging concept or um, construct has been around for a really long time. And the reason why it has been around for so long is because it makes it super easy to stay on message. Essentially, the way that you work with this triangle, if you're not familiar with the messaging triangle, is that the center of the triangle is the sweet spot. That's the narrative change, the message that we want to get across to the community. That ending homelessness starts with a home. And there are three main points, the blue, the green, and the orange, that we should be reinforcing regularly to make the points um, that the, the way to end homelessness is starting with a home. So these are um, the beauty of a messaging triangle is that they don't come in a particular order. There's not a priority. You can bounce around to one side or the other. And when you're engaged in a dialogue, whether that's with your neighbor or an elected official or a media outlet, um, it gives you the flexibility to be in the moment in a conversation and have the tools, or in this case, the talking points to respond to anything that may come up in a really flexible way. Um, these message points play up the theme um, of opportunity um, as the, the top theme that we knew makes sense, and they incorporate some compassion and some of the key, maybe more specific data or points that we learned worked in the five-month digital campaign. So the three points around the side. Stable housing means making sure every San Diegan has the opportunity to succeed. We're going to dig in a little bit more with some supplementary um, talking points to back that up. Um, you'll see that there is some um, focus on getting a job, um, and that is also not what we mean. Uh, with the opportunity to succeed. For some, that may be what success looks like. For others, it might be just getting off the street and being in stable home, uh, housing. Um, for others, it might be um, the opportunity to succeed at taking care of their well being or rejoining with their family. Lots of ways that um, success can be defined here. 
um, it's very closely related to starting with a home gives um, security so that San Diegans can focus on their well being. Um, and, and I saw one of the questions come up about housing first being such a trigger and and yeah, that is not unexpected. Um, and you'll see what we say here and it goes back to what drew drew was talking about is that we're not saying um, housing first and then end. What we're saying is if we can get a, get folks into stable, permanent, safe homes, then we can address the well-being. And certainly there are a lot of folks who have um, mental health issues or physical um, ability issues that can be best addressed once they've got a safe place to call home. And then the third really digs into equity, that creating affordable housing means equity for all. I think it's important to acknowledge that our um, year doing this messaging was um, during the year of George Floyd's murder and the racial justice uprising. Um, so there had been um, an increase in um, social discussion and understanding and maybe openness to um, what racism can mean in our communities. For those of us that work in the homelessness industry, we know that um, we have disproportionate representation from several communities within our um, uh, folks who are homeless. Um, and we also saw that people responded really well to ensuring that when you're starting with a home, it's an equitable home that all folks can afford so that more people can get into them. Um, so we're going to um, dig into the supplementary talking points that go with these three main points. But first, uh, on the next slide, Jeremy, I just want to pause and talk about key things that you need to know when using a messaging triangle. Uh, I say this to my clients all of the time. If you think you are always saying the same thing and maybe you're kind of bored with what you're saying, that is great, you are messaging. Um, for the amount of people that hear one single TV interview or read one tweet or maybe read an op-ed or might hear you at city council, there are thousands, maybe millions of people who did not get the opportunity to hear you say that. So really strong messaging means that you're being repetitive because you're always saying the same thing. And now we are asking you as our allies in this work for all of us to all be saying the same thing, starting with these key messages. And if we can do that, that is where narrative change comes. Um, so when do you use a messaging triangle? Always, always come back to this main point and always utilize the three main points that um, back up the, the main premise that solving homelessness starts with the home. So in your funders meetings, in your annual reports, how you're posting on social media, what you're sending in your emails, at cocktail parties, mowing the grass with your neighbor, when you're speaking up at city council, when you're training your staff or your team who might not even be on the front lines. These are all opportunities to be on message to ensure that anybody who you come in touch with is also on message. Another key point, um, and you see it in here in the language that we're using specifically, is to keep it simple. I've been working with a homeless service provider through Mixty for about nine years, and um, I'm familiar with terms like supportive permanent housing, bridge housing, interim shelters. I hear all of that. And even as a person who's somewhat been exposed to these kind of messages over time, I still really have to think about what that means. So you'll see that we're not using that language here. What we're talking about is a, a home, a permanent quality, affordable home. Um, and that simple language anybody can understand and connect with. So just generally, those are really important concepts to keep in mind when working on messaging from a messaging triangle. So now I want to dig in just a little bit deeper. Um, so when you use a messaging triangle, um, you make your point. So we are now looking at the blue, the top of the triangle, that it means making sure every San Diegan has the opportunity to succeed. We are now offering you some backup talking points um, that in order to succeed, it, it means that everyone 
has um, or deserves to have a job or to live in high quality affordable housing regardless of their circumstances. This is something that we heard in our digital marketing campaign that really resonated with people. But we also know that it's not just about the job, right? Um, it is also just about improving economic well-being. Um, how do you get your monthly check from the government to buy food and take care of yourself if you don't have an address? Basic things that we know that are critical for economic well-being um, start with having a permanent home. Um, and that we also know once a person is a home, then they, um, if, we, if we design our community systems correctly, then they have access to the support and services that they need to help them reach that goal, right? So if it's job training or going back to school or um, just skills to learn how to navigate through a community, all of that is easier if they can connect to a person at where they live. When we dig into the next message, we'll look at the green. Um, this really gets at the well-being, and and uh, I'm pretty sure um, between what Michael presented and what Drew presented, we um, talked a lot about how drug addiction and mental illness is um, the biggest um, uh, blame that people uh, apply to why folks become homeless. Um, so, and, and again, back to the question that popped up in the Q&A, we know that those things, we have a better chance at taking care of if we can start with a home. Um, I think this last year in the pandemic, when mental health and anxiety issues rose for people globally, regardless of whether you had a home or not, um, is a really great moment in time to think about how mental health issues can affect anyone. Um, and how, if, if you don't have the security of a home to come to at the end of the day, um, how could any of us manage to take care of our mental health, right? So it starts with getting folks in a home and then we can get to the place where we can manage those serious or chronic issues. Um, and that also, uh, you know, mental health is one thing, but we have a large portion of our homeless population that um, has disabilities. And how, how can you take care of your, your physical um, disabilities if you don't have a place from which you can do that well. Um, so we know that the what we call wraparound services are super critical. And um, what our research shows is that um, people really support those. And we know that the folks are more likely to participate in them and benefit from those social inclusion services. Um, or care that addresses trauma if they've got um, that stable foundation to start with. Um, and then there's a little bit of workforce housing, uh, or sorry, workforce language in this one um, that, you know, for the folks who did have careers or who want to return to a job, it's really the foundation of having a home that helps you get there. And then in our final message, where we look at equity, um, this is really where we can dig into the data around the disproportionate representation based on race, class, and age that we see in our homeless population. Our senior population is really um, struggling, and especially since COVID. Um, but we know folks with disabilities are also overrepresented. Um, and for the folks who think that homelessness is a, is a choice or that folks are lazy, um, we want to provide the opportunity to reinforce that this isn't a choice, that folks get here because the systems were developed in a way, our societal systems were developed in a way that lead people um, into these circumstances. And then essentially, um, housing is a right and needed for, every, needed for everyone. Um, so those are, those are the backup points. Um, I do wanna talk about what this means for you again, walking away from today, how do you take action right after this webinar to start putting those things into play? So these tips help you take this language and put it into um, whatever communication channels you have. Jeremy, if you could go to the next slide. Um, these are these are based on data, right? And they are the best research that we could provide locally, um, but they're not meant to be memorized. I don't expect that any of you would take these three points and the three backup points for each side of the triangle and go memorize it and verbatim, we're all saying that. You all have your own style personally, your organization that you work for has its style um, it has its own voice and it's super critical that you take 
this messaging and put it into your own voice and style so that it's organic and natural to who you are as a person or an organization, depending on your role in the community. It's also super critical to fill in um, your own stories or statistics, your anecdote and your program specifics for it. Um, I just wanted to give you an example of what I mean by that, because this is probably one of the most critical components to effective messaging, right? Stories are the thing that make our world go round. So if I, if I tell you that, um, that solving homelessness starts with a home, and that once we get people into a home, we can do some job training for them, and then they have the opportunity to succeed. That is what the messaging says. Could also say... Um, to solve homelessness, it starts with getting people into a home. Um, if we can get people in a home, let me tell you a story about John, who we got into um, a stable, permanent place. And John was then able to join a culinary arts program. And in that program that we offered, John got to learn how to work as a chef or a sous chef in a kitchen. And he's now employed by a local restaurant. Um, but John's not the only person who's been through that program. That program, because we get people into a home and can put them into that job training program that we offer, we've had X percentage of clients get into a self-sustaining job. What I have done is taken one side of the triangle, the key narrative that we're wanting to change, and I've paired it with a fictional story, but of a, of a person who went through an actual program and I filled in some su success statistics. That is how you take this and apply it to your organization and put it to use right away. Um, that gets the message going, but that also fits in with the work that you all are doing. And the last point is super critical, and I haven't been able to keep up with all of the questions popping in. Um, I'll look at them in a second, but knowing your redirects and pivots are super critical. Um, the, the one, uh, so this is not unique to a messaging triangle. This, politicians are really good at this. So if you, if you don't know what a redirect or a pivot is, study politicians, they do it really well. It's essentially not answering the question put in front of you, but answering the question that you want to answer or just talking about what you want to talk about. What we saw in our digital marketing campaigns when we were trying to educate people, for instance, on the equity issue um, that, that Black community members are overrepresented in our homeless population. Um, we would get just the random responses, right? But a lot of people blame immigration as the reason why San Diego's homeless population is so large. And I don't want to go down the immigration rabbit hole. I don't want to talk about it. It's not right. I don't want to um, further that misnomer. Um, and so when you use a redirect or a pivot, you just don't answer it. So one way, just as an example, if that is a comment that you might get at some point in your talking career about homelessness, you can say, well, that's an interesting take on it. That's just a pivot. That's an interesting take. Um, or maybe you could say, well, the way I see it is that um, our Black community is overrepresented in um, the housing population. And so the real challenge for us is to address systemic issues of racism that prevent generations of our Black community members from generating wealth and buying homes, and therefore falling into a system that continually um, challenges their economic well being and contributing to more folks being homeless. And if we can do that and start with a home, getting more people into homes, this is how we're gonna solve homelessness in San Diego. So essentially I'm um, not acknowledging the actual question and I am pivoting back to the message triangle so that we can stay on message to the things that we know that work. The key for a redirect or a pivot is to know your actual phrase. Um, so don't try to know them all. Um, that's an interesting take. And here's what I'm gonna talk about. If that feels comfortable to you, go for it. Um, but these are, the, these are the tips that are gonna help you um, take these messaging pieces and stay on message, be repetitive, and also put them into your own style. We're gonna go through um, three examples of what these can look like. 
I'm actually just gonna give you a moment to read this. Um, essentially what this is, is an example of what it looks like in writing when you work on the first message point that stable housing means every person has the opportunity to succeed. This is what it can look like with an opportunity take. I'm sure many of you attending this webinar work on maybe one or two, or perhaps all of those bullet points. Um, it's a pretty simple message to create, um, doing the things that we already know work here in San Diego. If we look at the second, um, second piece of the triangle, the green one, Jeremy, here's what it can look when we put it into play to talk about um, mental health issues. And then if we go to the final message, this is actually um, one of the ads or a portion of one of the ads that we ran that people responded to really well. But this is what it looks like with an equity for all approach. So with that, um, I think, Michael, do I pass it back to you? So with that, we move on to next steps um, and our recommendations, and that will go over to Amy. So you've all heard like the background, all the polling, all the research we've done. Then we gave you um, real messaging you can use in the form of messaging triangle to speak with, speak with your community. And you are an integral part of making this successful. And where do we go from here? So next steps, um, the purpose of why we did this and embarked on this campaign was, was to figure out what, what would resonate with the community and then to continue our campaign and to continue to amplify this message. So we know, and we've heard throughout this, that consistent messaging creates a pattern. And as Jamie said, once you feel like you've said the messaging over and over and over again, that's when people finally hear you. So we need to continue to be on message together and to con continue to repeat what we're saying. Um, and we actually saw this through the campaign that, that the public would develop a comfort level um, from, from hearing the solutions and centering housing. Uh, and then we also heard that using the opportunity theme would, would, is more likely to resonate with the community when they, um, are, they're more likely to hear the messaging. So another part of the solution is um, of local officials and providers that we're, we're all here. There are, there are 94 of you here on this webinar, which is fantastic. So once again, all of us need to be amplifying the message, um, as Jamie said, and talking about it, whether it's at a cocktail party, whether it's um, in our newsletters to our donors, whether it's training our staff. And elected officials are also part of that solution. All of you are, uh, most of you are members of the RTFH COC. And so we really are counting on you to help us to amplify this message and continue to influence public opinion so that we can move the public dialogue and support elected officials in making the right choices. I think Kareem is next. Thanks. Well, as you heard from Drew, there's an overall fatigue and frustration across the board from San Diegans 
which is why they're asking for us to have to, to plan um, and having a timeline for solutions. They just want clarity on what we're going to do next. So, for example, with with recent funding opportunities, having yet to, to generate any kind of um, results or consensus in the, in the public eye, and I'm talking about things like Measure A or Project Room Key or any of the ARPA designated funds during the pandemic, any kind of housing solution takes time. While our local residents are just asking for plans that include clear goals and regular transparent progress reports to know if, if we're on track as a region with those objectives. We have a great start in that our elected leaders have, we have excellent plans. So at the city, we have the homeless action plan. The county has a new homeless solutions plan. The regional task force is finalizing our community plan. And these all center housing as the solution to homelessness. Um, so our elected officials and um, are aligned and our leaders are aligned in terms of what we know is going to get results. What is best practices? What are what are going to get people, more people into housing and reduce homelessness significantly. So we're aligned on the plans where we need to work together more is to be aligned on the messaging. And so, you know, for those of you who represent elected officials and we are actually meeting with elected officials one-on-one -on -one as part of this campaign to give these results. We really, the elected officials need to be aligned on our messaging as well as we do out in the community. And as we also mentioned, they need, the community needs to see these plans. We all know about them because we do this work, but the community needs to know when results are happening with these plans. So we need to be talking about success with our outreach programs. We need to be talking about um, when we successfully house people through Project Home Key. We need to be talking about how many people are getting into permanent housing every year and all these successes. So as we make progress on all of our community plans, our elected officials need to be talking about the progress that's being made. And we as leaders in the community need to be talking about the progress that's being made. And I'm really glad uh, this is gonna address, I think your question, Jessica, around equity messaging um, in the Q and A box here. Because while measuring sentiment in social media ads can be difficult to gauge, interest from the audience definitely peaked when ads ran on the subject of equity and race compared to those that were focused on housing costs or any other kinds of programs and services, as Michael told us. So much so that the average watch time for the video version was almost twice as long as the standard viewing time of a Facebook video. And if you're thinking about what that means, it is really a matter of seconds and it may be in single digits, but when you're talking about the attention span on social media and how quickly, it, it, how quickly we can scroll through things, just getting that pause is a massive re, um, indicator of success. So what, what does this tell us? It tells us that people are listening and that the general public is ready to have this conversation. It also tells us that the two agencies in our region that are newly dedicated to ensuring systemic change across all government departments, and I'm specifically the ones listed here, which are the city's office of race and equity and the county's office of equity and racial justice, that those two agencies play a critical role in any ongoing implementation of strategic messaging. This is also an opportunity for, for, for you all to support the work of the RTFH. There is an ad hoc committee on addressing homelessness of Black San Diegans. And you all know this, this is really preaching to the choir, but according to the 2020 point in time count, Black persons accounted for 21% of the unsheltered population and 30% of the sheltered population, while only being about 5.5% of our general population across the county. And the purpose of, the, of this committee, why we're elevating it as such a good opportunity to educate constituents, is that the, the purpose of this committee is to explore the factors contributing to those disparities among Black persons experiencing homelessness, to listen and engage in this kind of extensive public dialogue with community stakeholders, and then to then develop a series of recommendations that the Council of Care can take to better address 
these impacts of systemic racism and its effects within the homeless crisis response system. So yes, we all have an opportunity to start put, shining a light on what is really behind homelessness. It is systemic. It is not choice. It is not a question of mental health. It, it is, it, the time is now. We have such a wonderful opportunity ahead of us. Another opportunity that we have here in terms of educating constituents, um, we know that permanent housing solutions take time, but there has to be an urgency. And I'm not saying this, this is not us extrapolating or making recommendations. This is what the surveys and what the, re the, the responses to the ads and the poll have been saying consistently that um, in the interim, we know that these things take time, but in the interim, there are short-term fixes is that like shared housing, rental subsidies, or reducing criminalization that can be used to move people off the streets and bridge them to more permanent opportunity. And to be honest, this was a little bit of the most, the, the tensest moment in this entire project as we were coming to this section of what are recommendations, because the general public is tired. And yes, we can say we need quick solutions, but it is such a knee jerk reaction. And I'm going to just give so much credit to Amy and the, the team at Funders Together, because it is such an easy knee jerk reaction when you hear we need quick solutions to equate that with shelter. And we know that's not the solution. We know that's a band aid that has been attempted and tried and repeated over and over in the region with very poor success. So what we know is that cities like Salt Lake and Houston have presented adaptive strategies um, that, that prioritize giving people housing and, and, and help them with temporary solutions. So we can highlight those, but we also have to acknowledge that San Diego is not Salt Lake and it's not Houston because we have a very different housing market. The inventory is different. The regulatory structure and environment to develop housing is very different. So we have some limitations that potentially other municipalities don't have, and that's just a reality. It doesn't make us any worse. It doesn't make us any bad um, or any better, but it does mean that we need to acknowledge this fatigue and we need to start elevating some of these interim solutions. So that brings us to kind of what we found in wrapping up. So as you've seen over the past hour, the consensus on all of this is that the public has a misunderstanding of what the solutions are. And we who are doing this work, we know how to solve homelessness and we're moving in the right direction. We have the plans moving in the right direction. And so we together need to continue to be consistent with our messaging and center housing as a solution to homelessness. Ending homelessness starts with a home. And the time to act is now. We need to be talking to our neighbors. We need to be working with elected officials. We need to be highlighting what we are, the successes we are having in our plans, and we need to do this together. So I really, we are gonna have Q and A right now, but before that, I wanna thank all of you. This is a great turnout. Um, the fact that we're all so interested in, in, in solving this together, I really appreciate you and all the work you're doing. Those of you who are on the front lines, and the amazing work you're doing to end homelessness in San Diego. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Michael and, and he's gonna go through some of the Q&A questions. Uh, the white paper, as you can see, go to catalystsd.org slash end homelessness and you'll actually see the white paper with the results of the work that Mixie's done here. Thanks so much, Amy, and thanks so much, everyone. Um, like Amy said, you can go online to read the full report um, at the address that's listed on the, the slide here. Um, we now would like to open um, the floor to questions. Everyone, um, there's been a lot of questions already through the chat and the Q&A section. Um, so we'll start off with those, but if anyone has any additional questions, please put them in the Q&A section and we will try to address them. Um, mainly, um, it looks like, with the questions that we've received so far that there's some themes developing. Um, so the first question I wanted to look at was um, regards to um, housing first. Um, and this question came from Christina in the conversations we've 
had with our community in Carlsbad, Housing First was a lightning rod. People did not like the idea nor believe it was effective. They felt like we were going to be enabling people, people would take advantage, et cetera. Curious if that came up in all the research. Um, and so I wanted to pass this, um, I, I think Kareem and Amy um, uh, to you on um, how you your thoughts on housing first and using that in messaging. Well, maybe at, at the risk of, of sounding sassy right off the bat, I think the entire point of what we just did today is to say not to use those two words side by side when you're talking about the issue first. Um, it may be the technical policy response that we have in our plans, but when we're trying to engage people, um, it's not the way that we talk about it. So what you have heard us say is it start, it's things like it starts with a home. Um, so from a messaging standpoint, I think we, we try to stay consistent with not using those two words side by side, but to use the other ways in the messaging triangle to address housing first or to get to the concept of housing first. Now, specifically to how folks respond to those two words, I'm Drew, as the as the data and polling pro expert here, I, I'm gonna defer to you because I can't recall off the top of my head if um, if there was um, any specific responses to that. And Michael, maybe to jot your memory, we if any of the maybe comments on the social media ads brought it up, if you can remember any of that stuff. Uh, real quick, I agree with everything you just said, Kareem. I think, you know, in, in some ways that those two words together sort of push people into their corners, right, by subordinating one set of things they think is really important to something that they can think is important, but maybe uh, isn't going to be top of the top of mind. Said. So we, we don't want to force that choice if we don't have to. That said, uh, the actual term housing first, if you look at that forced choice exercise, it's in there. but we qualify it by saying getting people into stable, affordable housing first and then addressing other needs. So we use both the term housing first and we use the word affordable, uh, which I know there's a lot of discussion in the chat on that. It's a whole other <laughs> set of uh, thing that, things to discuss, but, um, but, it, but you know, so those terms are in there and I, I realize they could be lightning rods, but people responded pretty well to them. And again, these are moderate uh, San Diego voters who, uh, who accepted that when we qualified it with and then addressing other needs so that we're uh, acknowledging that we understand that supportive services are a big part of this. So I, I think it's we probably shouldn't use it on its own if we can avoid it, but I'm also not 100% convinced that it's dangerous based on the data that we have. Jamie, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to add that when we, when we started with that big body of research and summarized it into the five themes. Housing first was one of the five themes, and it didn't rise to um, the level of acceptance that opportunity with some compassion thrown in there did. Um, and so that is just, I think, a really direct way of saying that it people didn't respond well to it. So my recommendation would be to not use that term. It is a trigger. Politically, it means something different than what we are talking about here, which is what Drew said, start with the home and then we can work on all of these other things. Um, so I, I just think from what we learned, it's not a good phrase to use um, when we know that there are other phrases that do resonate well with our larger body of people. Why, why not start there? Yeah, great point, Jamie. And just to kind of speak on what Kareem was saying about the digital ads, in the digital ads that we ran, we never used the term housing first in any of our ads. And we did that purposely, but more we were trying to focus on the themes um, in the idea of opportunity um, and not so much in the technical language of something like housing first. And you'll also see in our messaging triangle, housing first isn't there as well. Um, next, um, I wanted to, in Jamie, I think this is up your alley. It's a great question from Jessica. How do we tell stories about success in ways that honor the dignity of the person rather than the hero or savior narrative that places the housing and service providers at the center of the story? 
Yeah, it's a that's a great question. Um, and actually, I think the answer is sort of built into the question, which is you you lead with their story when possible, have them tell their own story. It is, um, in fact, their story. Um, but it's framing it from their perspective, right? So it's not um, how I'm a homeless service provider and how I helped Joe, who is my fictional guy who went through the culinary arts program, but rather here's Joe and this is Joe's story and this is the work Joe did in a culinary arts program and now look at where Joe is at today and our organization can help more of that. It's slightly nuanced, but it's literally just leading with the person's story and showing their work work and their effort and their talent. Um, and that that is honoring um, the work they're doing without putting yourself as the savior in the moment. Thanks, Jamie. So um, another thing that we're also a theme that uh, uh, theme we're finding in the questions and just kind of to address it overall. Um, and I'm going to go with the a question from um, Sorry, I had the question up and then I just lost it. Oh, it's from Amy who is asking is, is affordable housing a trigger um, in the sense that it implies a type of housing? Would it be better to frame it as housing that one could afford? Would that sit better with people? Um, and I'm gonna start us off and, and say that yes, that framing of housing that they can afford, it speaks directly to the opportunity theme that we're, we're pointing out. Um, and also more than just that, it's also the idea of the opportunity for people to have quality housing. So it's not just necessarily that they can afford it, but also um, that they have good housing, quality housing as well. Um, Jamie uh, or Amy, I wasn't sure if anything else you would wanna chime in there. I actually took a moment um, when I saw the amount of questions that came up around that, I took a moment to go back through our ads to look at the language that we had tested. And we didn't actually use affordable housing in um, any of the language. So I may have brought that here as an additional phrase. Um, so I apologize for that piece of it. Um, we weren't testing that, we were testing housing as a solution to homelessness and we, we stuck very closely to that aligned with the different um, themes. So yeah, I, um, I love that there's some existing research on, um, on how to phrase it and absolutely everything that Michael said to just go with that and incorporate it. If you guys, I, just a little color commentary, I'll just make this quick, I, I agree with all of that. There are better ways to talk about it that are more encompassing and speak to people. And there's always a, you know, you're entangling homelessness and housing and uh, they're connected, but for a lot of voters, they hear homelessness and that leaves them out of the housing conversation. So there's like a whole other element to this that's, um, but what, what I will say is, uh, I agree with everything that's been said. There's definitely better ways to say it. The but we've been recently testing, like stress testing the concept and the and the term affordable housing, and I, even that now has become shorthand for a lot of other things. And people are pretty accepting of it. So we've, I, I'll just give you an example. I recently asked a question in the city of San Diego that was, would you support or oppose uh, the creation of new affordable housing in your neighborhood? It's like the toughest possible test. The toughest possible bar to clear and it was like 60 to 20 in favor in san diego so i think there's i think the stigma attached to that has become lessened as the, the housing crisis has skyrocketed over the over the course of the last year or so um, so i'm not saying we should use affordable housing i'm just saying that there's less stigma attached to it than there used to be perfect thanks drew um this is a. Uh, uh, question from Jessica, how do you use the opportunity, and this is a really good question, and how do you use the opportunity message, which largely seems to, in I, I believe what Jessica is getting at, in the examples that we've provided today, focus on employment, and given the rise of housing insecurity and homelessness among seniors who are less likely to join, rejoin the workforce given age and health conditions? Um, would anyone at the panel like to take a stab at that question? Go ahead, Jamie. I'm actually gonna combine this with some work that we did with the San Diego Seniors Community Foundation. 
Um, so it, I, I acknowledged that there was a large response in our digital marketing ad to the concept of um, economic well-being as getting a job. Um, and that is not what we mean, right? A, a person's economic success um, in that opportunity frame is defined by that person and what they are able to do. Um, one of, this is just a kind of fun little side note to explore as a way to respond. Um, one of the things that I learned through the San Diego Seniors Community Foundation is how much our senior population gives back to the community in daycare, in um, volunteering, in mentoring young people. And imagine what we lose if those folks don't have a place to call home. It's um, a, a critical component of our economy and our livelihood in San Diego. And maybe they're not making a paycheck for it, um, but we all benefit from the fact that there is this large force of seniors who have time to give. Um, and I think there's something there that you can play with um, that certainly is contributing to a person's success or um, well-being in an, in an opportunity frame that doesn't actually result um, in a, in a direct-to-hire job kind of outcome. Thanks, Jamie. Um, so a question that came up um, while Drew was speaking earlier um, was, uh, how does strategy 360 determine who is moderate? And I think kind of like getting uh, not totally into the weeds, Drew, but is that from a early query? If so, what happens to those who answer differently? Yeah, it's, it was, it's self response because there's no government data or anything on that on the voter file, there's modeling, um, but it, it was uh, self response. And uh, if people were opted into the survey based on identifying as moderate uh, and screened out if they identified as anything else. Thanks, Drew. Um, another question from Robert. I'm concerned that, um, this is going back to housing first, if we can jump back for a moment. I'm concerned that we are moving away from keep it, from keeping it, we're moving away from keep it simple by surrendering how, housing first to vocal feedback. In other words, we're moving from two words to lengthy phrases now and the language that we've set up. Um, would being consistent with housing first followed by clarifiers be more consistent and simple? I'm, I'm happy to kick that off. Um, housing first doesn't mean anything to anybody who's not in the industry. Um, so while it may be a short phrase and those words in themselves, we might be able to define if you're talking to a person who isn't one of, of our participants here, um, it doesn't have, it doesn't carry any meaning. So to, to take the opportunity and to use words um, that people understand and to describe um, what we mean in very simple words may it take a few more words probably but i think it's okay because the the meaning and the value of that meaning that we're able to get across will um land will be received well will be understood much better than relying on jargony shortcuts that um those who who are surrounded by it every day um uh, get to apply a meaning to go ahead kareem and I'm, I, thanks. I, I may take a slightly different angle as well, Robert, in answering your question that, and I think we live in a time where there is heightened sensitivity and, and heightened vocalization and opposition in public settings. Um, but if we can step back, and that is our job sometimes to, to look at the big picture that it, and it takes a lot of humility from all our part to step back and say, is there a nugget of truth in all of that vocal opposition? And what is it? And where, where are folks, what is the commonality among some of the pushback? And if we, if we take out some of the, um, the really, maybe the extremes, if we look at the, like the bell curve and the folks who make it to the media with their, their crazy public comments, if we take that crowd out, but we look Listen at, to, we listen to the folks who have questions or who are pushing back. 
I think that it takes a lot of work on our end to just ask ourselves where where are they coming from and and can we can we meet them halfway and i think that that's what we're trying to do here which is the trigger is the combination of those two words we put two capitals in front of them we're pushing it as a policy response and that doesn't resonate with folks so it's it's there's another way to get there and that's okay we're meeting them where they're at and we would do the very same thing in any kind of other social services, we, we're very proud of meeting people where they're at. And it's, it, I think it just takes that level of humility to acknowledge that in our own communication sometimes as well. Thanks, Kareem. Um, a question that just came in was, because we're seeing so many populations of people being homeless and doing your research, did you find that our use in elders numbers are growing among the homeless population? I'm just gonna answer that real quick and say that in our research, we was focused on the, the messaging and we didn't actually, in our work, do research on the numbers of in the homeless population. Um, that's not what we were focused on, it was more of the, the messaging with the public. Um, so we didn't have actual research on, on those numbers. Um, I know we're getting close to time. Uh, another item I wanted to add is that I've seen a lot of questions about if these slides will be made available. Um, we will definitely do that. Um, I'm pretty sure that we can email the slides to everyone who's joined this webinar today. Um, and provide those for you so you can run through them, um, especially the, the messaging sections that Jamie was so great to go over earlier um, in the webinar. Um, and then if there's any last minute questions, um, drop them in. And if not, then I, I think that concludes our session for this morning. Yeah, thank you. So. I want to thank Mixi Communications, um, Jamie, Kareem, and Michael for this excellent work. And I'd like to thank Drew Lieberman with Strategies 360. Um, so, and the, the members of Funders Together for, for funding this work and supporting this narrative change campaign. And then mostly I'd like to thank all of you for the work you're doing on the front lines and the fact that you're all here today to learn this and to work with us together. So as we move into phase two, you're all going to be getting these slides. It seems like there's a lot of energy around social media content, about additional message training. So we really appreciate your feedback and we'll take that back to our group and consider what are our next steps for continuing to move this work forward. So thank you all of you for being here today and uh, have a great day.